sometimes you don't know how your clothes are going to work <laughs> in certain situations, like going up those stairs. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank Mara for that amazing introduction. Thank you, sweetie. I'm your biggest fan. It's always a, a pleasure to come to Atlanta and, and go on Mara's show. And it's always great to come to Atlanta and see all of the fabulous women. And I have seen some amazing shoes. <laughs> I saw some over there. Who has the multicolored shoes? You have to show them. <laughs> Those are incredible. Those deserve a round of applause. So, oh, people couldn't see them. I guess you have to hold them up. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Those are great multicolored shoes. I love those. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming, and I also want to thank the volunteers here at the Margaret Mitchell House who, uh, you know, come and volunteer at these events, I guess just because they, they love books. I don't know. I hope that's true. And they love the Margaret Mitchell House, which, which is fabulous. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from my new book, One Fifth Avenue, and then we will do questions and answers, and then I will be signing copies of your book out there at the, on the porch of the Margaret Mitchell House. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my new book, One Fifth. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the characters. Uh, there's Lola Fabricant, and she is 22 years old. She's come to New York to find a West Village apartment and her own Mr. Big. And she, Time Magazine calls her the perfect avatar of a young woman today. I don't know if that's good or bad. She knows all of her labels. And she is, you know, causes a lot of trouble for all of the older characters, which is always fun, and she's very, very naughty. Um, the second character is Annalisa Rice. She is in her early 30s. She was a lawyer. Um, her husband was originally a mathematician, but was discovered by some hedge funders, those evil hedge funders, and became, becomes a hedge fund manager himself and becomes incredibly, incredibly rich. Um, and very strange. So Annalisa has to deal with her new status of being very, very wealthy. Um, obviously, I finished the book a couple of months ago because gosh only knows what's happening to those hedge funders today. <laughs> Although good things don't happen to Paul in the end, so it's okay. Hope nobody here is a hedge fund manager. <laughs> Aren't they all in New York or something? Uh, and then there is Mindy Gooch. She's one of my favorite characters. Mindy is in her early 40s. I think we all know a Mindy. She's been working her whole life. Her husband is yeah, a not so successful novelist who's pursued his dream. She has a son. She has a high powered career, but she's not going anywhere. And she and her family live in the worst apartment in 15th Avenue. And she's bitter, and she sort of has a network epiphany moment where she says, you know what, I've been doing it all for years, and now on top of everything I'm supposed to be happy? Well, I'm not. So she starts a blog about how she's sick of everyone telling her to be happy, and she's just going to be realistic about her life. Um, and then there is Schiffer Diamond, who is an actress who comes back to New York, she's in her late 40s, she comes back to New York to refine, restart her career, and to find an old love. And then there is Enid Merle, who is a gossip columnist, and she is 83. And she's kind of the puppet master. She's seen everything, and she knows everything, and she pulls some of the strings in One Fifth Avenue. Um, so the book is, One Fifth Avenue is a real building in New York City, which I have uh, really, really fictionalized, but it's about new money versus old money. It's about 
art versus commerce. And it's about how the new replaces the old and how in some ways the city never changes. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit and then we'll do a Q&A. Schiffer Diamond has taken a part in a TV series, Enid Merle said to her nephew, Philip Oakland. She must be desperate, Philip said half-jokingly. Enid and Philip occupied two of the second best apartments in one-fifth, located on the 13th floor with adjoining terraces, separated by a charming white picket fence. It was across this fence that Enid now spoke to her nephew. It may be a very good part, Enid countered, consulting the piece of paper she held in her hand. She's going to play a mother superior who leaves the church to become the editor-in-chief of a magazine for teenagers. Now there's a believable concept, Philip said, with the sarcasm he reserved for most matters Hollywood. About as believable as a giant reptile that terrorizes New York. I wish you'd quit screenplays and go back to writing serious novels, Enid scolded. Can't, Philip said with a smile. I'm desperate. Well, I just talked to Roberto, Enid said, referring to the head doorman. Schiffer Diamond may be coming back today. A housekeeper was seen in her apartment this week getting it ready. Roberto says she may be moving back permanently. Isn't that exciting? I'm thrilled, Philip said. I wonder how she'll find New York, Enid said, having been away for so long. Exactly the same, Auntie, Philip said. You know New York never changes. The characters are different, but the play remains the same. Later that afternoon, Enid Merle was putting the finishing touches on her daily gossip column when a sudden gust of wind slammed shut the door to her terrace. Crossing the room to open it, Enid caught sight of the sky and stepped outside. A mountain of thunderclouds had built up on the other side of the Hudson River and was rapidly approaching the city. This was unusual, Enid thought, as the early July day hadn't been particularly hot. Gazing upward, Enid spotted her neighbor, Mrs. Louise Houghton, who was standing on her own terrace wearing an old straw hat and holding a pair of gardening shears in her gloved hand. In the last five years, Louise Houghton, who was nearing 100, had slowed down a bit, spending most of her time attending to her prize-winning roses. Hello, Enid called loudly to Mrs. Houghton, who was known to be slightly deaf. Looks like we're in for a big thunderstorm. Thank you, dear, Mrs. Houghton said graciously, as if she were a queen addressing one of her loyal subjects. Enid would have been annoyed, if not for the fact that this was Mrs. Houghton's standard response to just about everyone now. You might want to go inside, Enid said. Despite Mrs. Houghton's quaint grandeur, which was off-putting to some, Enid was fond of the old lady, the two having been neighbors for nearly 60 years. Thank you, dear, Mrs. Houghton said again, and might have gone inside, but for a flock of pigeons that flew abruptly out of Washington Square Park, diverting her attention. In the next second, the sky turned black, and rain the size of pellets began to pummel Fifth Avenue. Enid hurried inside, losing sight of Mrs. Houghton, who was struggling against the rain on her spindly old legs. Another strong gust of wind released a lattice screen from its moorings and knocked the elegant old lady to her knees. Lacking strength to stand, Louise Houghton tipped sideways onto her hip, shattering the fragile bone and preventing further movement. For several minutes, she lay in the rain until one of her four maids, unable to locate Mrs. Houghton in the vast 7,000 square foot apartment, ventured outside and discovered her under the lattice. Meanwhile, on the street below, Two town cars were slowly making their way down Fifth Avenue like a small cortege. When they reached one-fifth, the drivers got out and hunched against the rain and shouting oaths and instructions began pulling out the luggage. The first piece was an old-fashioned Louis Vuitton steamer trunk that required the efforts of two men to lift. Roberto, 
the doorman hurried out, paused under the awning, and immediately called for backup before waving the men inside. A porter came up from the basement, pushing a large cart with brass poles. The drivers heaved the trunk onto the cart, and then one after another, each piece of matching luggage was piled on top. Down the street, a strong gust of wind ripped an umbrella out of the hands of a businessman, turning it inside out. It scuttled across the pavement like a witch's broom, coming to rest on the wheel of a shiny black SUV that had just pulled up to the entrance. Spotting the passenger in the back seat, Roberto decided to brave the rain after all. Picking up a green and white golf umbrella, he brandished it like a sword as he hurried out from under the awning. Reaching the SUV, he angled it expertly against the wind so as to protect the emerging passenger. A blue and green brocade shoe with a kitten heel appeared, followed by the famous long legs clad in narrow white jeans. Then a hand with the slim, elegant fingers of an artist. On the middle finger was a large aquamarine ring. At last, Schiffer Diamond herself got out of the car. She hadn't changed at all, Roberto thought, taking her hand to help her out. Hello, Roberto, she said as easily as if she'd been gone for two weeks instead of 20 years. Crap weather, isn't it? Thank you. All right, so let's do some questions and answers. Who has a question? Right here. Can you tell us where you got your purse? Oh, yes. Um, my purse is a, it's a Louis Vuitton bag, and I actually bought it several, well, about three or four years ago. And it's kind of indestructible, so I always take it on book tours so it can get banged up. Yes, oh, another question? Okay. Actually, I didn't. Michael Patrick King, who wrote and directed many episodes of Sex and the City, wrote and directed the movie, and he just did a fantastic, yeah, fantastic job. job well, I, I actually, I don't write scripts. Um, I, I did work on the pilot episode of Lipstick Jungle, um, but I... It's, it's very difficult to write scripts and write novels at the same time. And um, it's, you know, they're both very time consuming. So some people do both. I have kind of just chosen to write novels. Um, and also in TV, I don't know if people are aware of this, but, um, you know, it takes many, you know, one of the big differences between a novel and a TV series is that, a novel is, is written by one person. And on a TV series, it's really, really a collaborative effort and literally requires hundreds of, of people to do it. And it's very segmented, you know. Every, there, like, there's one person who, you know, puts out the chairs. And, and on all TV series, there's what's called a writer's room um, where the writers meet usually once a day when they're, you know, at the beginning of a, of a, a season. And, you know, everybody brings their own experiences and, and, you know, as a group, they will work out the arcs of the different storylines. Uh, so for Sex and the City, I worked with the writers the first two seasons. I was in the writer's room. And then on Lipstick Jungle, the writer's room is in Los Angeles. So I'm not in the writer's room, but I go to the set and I read every draft of every script. So I realized the other night when I was um, re-watching the first episode of the second season of Lipstick Jungle, I know every single line. <laughs> <laughs> so I just watch, you know, waiting for, and I actually think my favorite line in the second season is when Rosie Perez says to um, and Rosie Perez plays Dahlia, a publicist who Victory Ford hires to get her business going. Um, 
the, Dahlia is talking about um, uh, Joe Bennett, and she says, you're still in love with that man, aren't you? I don't know. It's my favorite line so far. <laughs> um, but I, I have to say, I, you know, I've been very, very lucky as a novelist to just have so many talented people involved in Sex and the City and Lipstick Jungle. And, and I mean, I just, I love the series. I love the movie. I think I've watched it three or four times. And, and I don't know, that's, I think it's really, really good. I mean, I think it's, I think, you know, that movie may be a classic. It's, it's really good. So I wouldn't change a thing. I love all of it. Uh, Sure. Okay. Yes. All right. The question is of all the characters I've created, which one is my favorite and why? Um, it's a little bit of a hard question to answer. Um, you know, actually, one of my favorite characters is Janie Wilcox, who was in Four Blondes and Trading Up. And she's, you know, crazy as can be, and, and she causes trouble wherever she goes. And, and in the book Trading Up, I'm so much in that character's head. Um, you know, my husband actually said to me, most people probably aren't even in their own heads as much as you're in the head of that character. And, and you know, I love Mindy Gooch in One Fifth because Mindy is bitter. And she also, she's a comic character. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I love the, the comic characters. And Mindy's kind of like comic relief. And, and yet she's, she's so, I don't know, she's so real. Like Mindy never, she like disdains getting dressed up. And, you know, and like in the winter she's always cold. And when she has to go to a restaurant, she just puts on an old pair of black tights. And I don't know, she just seems so... She seems so real to me. I mean, all of my characters seem real, but I, I would say those are two of my two of my favorites. Yes. Who's my greatest male mentor in writing? I, you know, I've never had a mentor. I, I've never, I've never had a mentor. Oh, I've had. There are many writers who I like to read and grew, grew up reading. Um, certainly, one of them is. Evelyn Waugh, and I think I probably started reading Evelyn Waugh when I was quite young, probably, I might have been 12 or 13. Um, I was always like a big, big, big reader, and, and I learned to read at a very early age. I learned to read actually before I was, went to kindergarten, and I grew up in a small town um, with a wonderful library. And we didn't have a movie theater. So for me, like a big night out was, was going to the library. And my parents would, would just kind of drop us off. And, you know, we would, I would just like wander around in the, in the library, you know, for hours. And, okay, we were down in the children's books, but the adult books were upstairs. So I was always sneaking around in the adult stacks and probably reading things that I shouldn't have been reading. Um, but I, I discovered, uh, you know, a lot of uh, writers that way, and and I always loved English writers. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I read C.S. Lewis, and and, I, and somebody, I, I think when I was probably four or five years old, I, I said that I wanted, when I grew up, I wanted to move to New York and be a writer and live in Manhattan, and I had never been to Manhattan, and, and someone said, well, why... You know, why did you have that dream? And I realized it's because of Eloise at the Plaza. <laughs> and it was one of my favorite books when I was little, and I loved Eloise and the Plaza, and it was so glamorous, and she had that turtle, Skipperdy. And then she, or maybe the dog was Skipperdy. I, I don't know if the turtle had a name. And then she had that funny little dog, like a little pug. And she had a nanny. So when I was a kid, I kept saying to my parents, like, how come we don't have a nanny? And they would just look at me like, where is she getting this idea? I mean, when I grew up, nobody had a nanny. And I also wanted to go to boarding school. 
which I think my parents were kind of insulted about. But I learned about all of these things from reading books, and I just, I thought that they were really glamorous. So, that's another question here. Well, you know, it's not, there's always a part of writing that is not conscious, and one doesn't necessarily decide these things. They, they kind of happen. And there is a part of writing that, uh, you know, it's not where one sits down and says, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to, you know, put a character here, have a character be from there, or have a character say this or say that. There's a part of it that, that's just kind of instinctual and one does by feel. And I think it would be the equivalent of, you know, everybody knows to trust their gut. And, and it comes much more out of that than any kind of conscious decision. So I just came up with this character, Lola Fabricant, and she's from Windsor Pines, which is outside of Atlanta, and Windsor Pines has lots and lots of golf courses, and I don't know, it just seemed right for the character. I mean, Lola is a, she's a very savvy character, and she, you know, knows about clothes and shoes and pop culture, and, and you know, and I think that the women in Atlanta are very sophisticated, so it just kind of, it kind of felt right that she would know about these things. And it would be believable that, um, that she would be very sophisticated. Yes, over here. The question is, what did I think about Louise from St. Louis? I thought she was fantastic. I thought that Jennifer Hudson was great. And I don't know. I mean, I just, I thought she was great. And, and I love that, you know, that character, that young woman who comes and, and helps carry. I mean, you know, as you can imagine, that's, that's you know, I've had similar experiences with, with my assistants. They're fantastic and I always feel like I'm a big sister and you know give them advice and give them clothes and <laughs> shoes and that kind of stuff I'm sorry <laughs> oh any openings you know I just hired someone because my my last assistant well she was 19 and she went to Florence for her um, you know, third year in college, her, her year abroad, and, and, and I'm really proud of her. So for me, I really related to that relationship between Carrie and Louise, and, I, and it, it felt very realistic to me, and, and um, I thought it was great. Yes, over here. Okay, the question is, what aspect of my life has impacted my writing the most? Um, that's a little bit of a hard question to answer. Um, you know, I'm somebody who I, I knew that I wanted to be a writer at a very, very young age, at the age of eight. So from then on, um, you know, I've, I've, I've always been someone who knew what they wanted to do. The question was not figuring out what I wanted to do, but how to do it. And I've, I've been writing professionally since I was 19, which is 30 years. Um, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's so much a part of my life and it's so much a part of my identity that I, you know, I kind of have a hard time in separating the two out. You know, it's, it's what I do and, and I actually sh structure my life around writing um, and it, it's something that that's something that, that I've done for a long time so I mean look the, you know when you're writing there are a lot of times in real life when you know one's life is it's not glamorous um, 
but it's, it's very, very satisfying. So, question back here. Okay, the question is, which character do I identify with the most? Um, you know, I identify with all of my characters in one way or another. Um, I really try to get under their skin and bring the characters to life. Uh, so as a writer, actually one needs to identify with all of the characters, you know, to some extent, male or female. Um, so it, it's hard to say. I mean, the one that is probably the closest to me would be Carrie Bradshaw, who was certainly my alter ego when I was writing the column. Uh, and, and I started writing the column Sex in the City in 1994, which is, you know, now a while ago. And when I started writing the column, I, I was 34. Um, so I, I, you know, that's the, that character is probably was originally, anyway, the closest to me and, and was kind of my alter ego. Um, and that wasn't necessarily deliberate. When I started writing the Sex and the City column, I went home to visit my parents, and my parents are very conservative. And they said, oh, we've gotten a subscription to the New York Observer. We're going to read your column every week. Isn't that wonderful? And I thought, yes, that's great. And, and then I immediately came up with the character of Carrie Bradshaw. So that, that was actually how she came about, as my alter ego. My parents, I've told this story so many times, and, you know, my parents have never said a word to me. <laughs> yes, a question from a man. What, what makes the perfect male character? Ah, well, what makes the perfect male character? Um, I, I, you know, I don't think there's any perfect male or perfect female. I, I mean, I think that characters are interesting when they're flawed and, um, you know, in terms of, of uh, you know, drama, you, you, you need characters who want something and you need characters who have flaws that make them human and, and, and you need characters who have things that they need to overcome or that they need to overcome and they don't overcome. Um, you know, that's kind of the black humor. Um, I had a Mr. Big, and I called him Mr. Big because he was big man on campus. Like he knew everyone in New York, and he did smoke cigars, only Cohibas. And, you know, I think that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> yes, every year. Okay, the, the question is, um, <laughs> uh, well, right, as we're going into a depression, right. Um, I, you know, well, first of all, I have to say, you know, and I, I don't want to be defensive about it, but I, I don't think that my characters are superficial. Um, I think that they're real people. And I, I think that human beings have been interested in a variety of things forever. Uh, you know, real estate is something that runs very deep in all of us. And one of the first things that we learn as children is that we need food and shelter. Um, in terms of, you know, people consuming things, I mean, come on, everybody here in this room consume something. And we live in a consumerist society. Um, you know, and none of this is new in any way. I mean, people's interest in clothes and shoes has been going on forever. When you think historically what people have done to be fashionable. Um, and, you know, people have been pampering themselves forever and um, gosh I was going to add something to that and you know even in terms of, of 
credit and going into debt. Uh, you know, if you recall in the book Vanity Fair, Becky Sharp goes into debt in order to have a certain lifestyle. And people who lived above and beyond their means has, was, has been a theme of social satire, um, you, you know, for certainly at least the last 150 years. Um, so it's, it's one of uh, the themes of, of human life. Um, and also in the book, I mean, the book is really about art versus commerce. And, you know, they're characters who are really looking for fulfillment through art. And, uh, you know, the, the book also deals with the mortgage crisis. Uh, it, it deals with certain things in the stock market. So the book is, is probably a little prescient in some way. One of the characters does, they do lose their house, and I'm not going to say which character. And, you know, that changes, that changes this character's behavior. Not for the better. <laughs> yes, over here. Okay, the, the question is, do I have friendships like, like the ones in, well, I would say Sex in the City and Lipstick Jungle. Um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, for me, I think, I think one of the things that, has, you know, has kind of changed, although, you know, you have to remember I'm 49 years old and, and you know, I'm going to reference things from 30 years ago, which for anybody young in the audience, it will seem like a really, really long time ago. To me, it doesn't seem like a long time ago. Um, but, you know, 30 years ago when I first moved to New York, um, it was, you know, you know, I grew up in my teenage years with 70s feminism, which was, you know, once again about women having it all. And one of the results of that was that women were going to college to get a college degree, and then after that they were going to have careers instead of going to college to get their MRS, their misses. And so in the early 80s, all of a sudden there was a huge influx of young women into the workforce and, and going places where, uh, you know, there were, of course, there have always been women who worked in offices and, and, you know, worked in all of these different environments, but there were so many young women um, and they were delaying marriage and I think you know certainly in a place like New York City when you know 30 years ago women were kind of on uncharted territory so there was a huge amount of a female bonding that went on that you know might you know maybe didn't happen as easily before where women would get married you know at 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and then have children, and then you're, you know, you have a new, a new family, and, you know, your loyalty is always to your children, uh, you know, and your family. So you may not be quite as open and, and frank uh, because, you know, you have more to lose. But uh, Sex and the City really, you know, came out of this very specific time when women were delaying marriage or were certainly having a hard time finding partners. I mean, the, you know, in the, in the 1980s, I used to write for women's magazines, and one of our themes was always the man shortage. And, you know, it was, you know, people said it was documented that, you know, there were just too many single women out there. and. And, you know, and there was the commitment crisis on the part of men. The women were, you know, were looking for partners and ready to get married, but the men wouldn't commit. And, and you know, Sex and the City directly 
comes out of that. And, and you know, the question of sex in the city was why are there so many great single women in their 30s and no great men to marry them? Um, but, you know, being, being a woman in those times where you really couldn't rely on men, I think it really pushed women together um, so that they really supported each other. And, and, you know, certainly when I was in my late 20s, uh, my girlfriends and I used to say that men are going to come and go, but your, your female friends will be there forever. And in a, in a place like New York City, um, you absolutely have to have female friendships to survive. And, um, you know, and, and, and then later on with Lipstick Jungle, one of the things that I noticed was that, you know, the women were a little bit older and were very successful because they'd been working for, for 20 years. But, you know, there's, a, there's certainly in a place like New York City, and, and, and I think that this is true everywhere now. You know, there are women's networking conferences, and, and it really is true that women can help each other, you know, a great deal in their careers. And, and that's something that, you know, one does in New York. I mean, I can't tell you how much female support I have, and it's wonderful. And, and you all are here tonight being very supportive, so I appreciate that. Okay. I can't see you back there. Okay, the question is, what are my personal routines? That sounds a little bit like personal hygiene. <laughs> what are my personal routines as a novelist? Um, Number one is commitment, and you absolutely have to be committed. Um, that was something that was harder for me to do when I was younger. You know, when you're when you're young, when you're in your 20s, there's just there's so many things that you want to do that that distract your attention. And the reality is, when you get older, or for me, as I got older, I was just able to become much more focused, which um, was very rewarding. Um, but I, I get up in the morning and, and I, I work, you know, depending on where I am in a novel, I'll work for, you know, three or four hours at the beginning. Uh, and, and then when I, I am, you know, have finished the first draft and, and I know more about the novel and I'm closer to my deadline, I'll sometimes write you know, for 12, 12 hours a day. And, um, you know, so I, you know, I may start off writing three or four pages a day, but usually at the, you know, when I'm at the end, I'll, I will write sometimes as, as much as 25 pages a day. So it's something that just builds up. But it's, it's you know, there's no, there's no magic formula and there's no secret. It's, it's just like everything else, it's putting in the time. And I, you know, and I always say to aspiring writers that it's, it's really about doing you. And, you know, every, everyone who's a, who's a writer has a voice and has things that they want to say, things that they want to explore and, and their world. And, and it's, it's, just, it's just about doing you. Um, the other thing is it, it may take a lot longer than you think it will. I mean, it is a profession that um, it does tend to weed people out because there usually isn't a lot of instant gratification. And I really didn't start to make any kind of, you know, a, a, an average amount of money until I was 34. And before that, I didn't have most of the things that, that many people take for granted. I didn't have a car. I didn't own any real estate. There were times when I, I didn't even have a bed. I didn't have furniture. I didn't have a TV. Um, you know, I didn't have utensils. 
Uh, I didn't have a dining room table. So, the, you know, the list goes on and on and on um, because I couldn't afford those things. So it, it goes back to, you know, everything in life. It's, it's about making a commitment. Uh, yes, over here. Um, it wasn't, but it, it certainly, there's a young woman in the front who's looking very shocked. <laughs> um, it wasn't based on anyone that I know, but it's, it's certainly something that came out of the writer's room. And, I, you know, I, I mean, honestly, I think you could probably go on certain websites and find out that, you know, that's, that's like a fetish for some people. <laughs> yes, over here. Okay. Uh, well, uh, first of all, in, in TV, again, TV and movies, there are many, many people involved. And there are, you know, you've got the studio. They're the ones who are putting up the money and paying for everything. Uh, so naturally they have a great amount of say. And, you know, that's business. That's how, that's how it works. Um, and, you know, it's a process. Uh, you know, there are always a lot of changes. Uh, you know, one of the, you know, one just basic factor is that the medium is so very, very different. Uh, you know, a novel is a very different medium than a TV series or a movie. Um, you know, in general, you're not in the characters' heads. And, uh, you know, in a movie or a TV series, and, you know, plot is really, really important, uh, you know, especially in network TV, where you, it's a very, very structured medium. Um, you know, there are five, you know, there's a teaser that is a certain, that's like eight minutes. It's very specific. Um, you know, each, you know, there are act breaks and all of those are very specific and are down literally to the second. And, you know, I'll, I'll often get cuts of something and it will say it's two seconds under or, you know, it's 30 seconds over. And, you know, so, so the medium obviously dictates some of what happens on the screen. And, uh, you know, in terms of any adaptations, I, I've never looked at anything and said, oh, I would do it differently. In fact, I'm, it's the very opposite. I'm, I'm really grateful and thrilled that there are people who want to uh, bring my work to life in another medium. And, you know, it takes many, many people to do that. So I'm always thrilled, frankly. Okay, I think we have time for one more question over here, this young lady's. Okay, the question is, how did I get the idea for my newspaper column and where did I find my best sources? Um, you know, the column was Sex in the City and it was, uh, it was something that evolved in a, in a sense, really from the first column to the second column. And I had been writing for the New York Observer and working very hard and the pieces that I did were very successful. So the editor asked if I wanted to have my own column. And I, you know, I had been doing pieces that would be precursors to Sex in the City for years in women's magazines. And the pieces were uh, basically, uh, they were fiction written as journalism. 
because I always was writing fiction when I was in my 20s and was somebody who wrote novels and put them in the, in the drawer. And, and I wanted to write fiction, but it, it, there just aren't very many outlets. So I did pieces that were precursors to Sex and the City where I would talk to friends and, for instance, one of the f first pieces that I, I did for Mademoiselle, I think, was dating in the office. And it was, you know, about a couple that they got together and they got together by fax. <laughs> because this was probably in 1983. And, you know, the fax was very new and exciting. Um, and, you know, in terms of sources, I, I mean, the, the column Sex in the City was really about social anthropology. So it really came out of my observations about different types of people. For instance, the bicycle boys. You know, these were the men that would go on a date on their bicycle. And then if they wanted to come, if they happened to spend, spend the night, then their bike would be cluttering up your apartment. Uh, so it's, it's really, really, it's really social anthropology. And, you know, the ideas for each one of the columns came from something that, that I observed. I'm going to do one more question and then we're going to do a signing. Over here, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, the question is about the Carey Diaries. Um, it's, it's a contract that I've recently signed. It's a, two young adult books about Carrie Bradshaw's early years. It just kind of came about organically. You know, again, with these kinds of things, there isn't, you know, a conscious kind of decision of I'm going to do it for this or that reason. It doesn't really, it doesn't really work, and it, it just doesn't, feel right. It was something that actually the first thing that I, I was paid for was a children's book. And when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I thought, oh, I'm going to be a children's book writer. And I really wanted to be, you know, um, like a rolled doll. And, you know, it didn't quite work that way. But, um, you know, it's just, it's something that, I don't know, it just, it seemed like a really interesting idea exploring Carrie as a young woman. And, you know, I think that I don't know that much about it because I haven't started writing it, but I see Carrie as an independent thinker and, uh, you know, as someone who, uh, you know, questions what society tells her about, you know, the way women should be. And, you know, is, is that way from a young age. So. That's pretty much all I know, but if you check back with me in a year, I'll know more. I want to thank you all for coming.